So friends, we are on an adventure right outside of Clarksville, Tennessee. I am going to Port Royal State Park just to see. I don't know if there's anything here to see or not, but we're going to cruise over here and see if there's anything to see. Can you say see, sí, senor? It's out there just a little ways. 1.6 miles. Si, sí, senor. Just beautiful out here. It's really a nice place. Love these farms up and down. This home right here. Really nice. Brand new. Right here is Port Royal State Historic Park. It says it's part of the Trail of Tears. So we're going to go in here and see what is happening. We're going to take a look at this Port Royal and find out what this is all about. Stay tuned. So I'm going to cruise up to the structure that is right here. We're going to see what this is all about. I have no knowledge of this place whatsoever, but I want to know. So I saw a historic marker on the left. I see some water. I see a bridge out in the distance. They're doing work on this house, restoring it. Some restoration work. Look at those old bricks. This thing's been here a while. It's had some repairs too. You can see where these bricks are a different color than those up there. It says, before the Civil War, hundreds of enslaved African Americans in Port Royal and on surrounding plantations and farms toiled so that the Red River Port could flourish as a center for tobacco inspection, storage, and shipment. Accordingly, like most Tennessee towns, middle Tennessee towns, the majority of Port Royal's white citizens supported the Confederacy. Local women organized a ladies' aid society, provide needed supplies to Company E of the 50th Tennessee Infantry, primarily comprised of Port Royal men. Most of them were captured or deserted at the fall of Fort Donelson on the Tennessee River in February 1862. After federal occupation in February 1862, many of the African-American men of Port Royal ran away to Clarksville to join the United States Colored Troops at Fort Bruce on the Cumberland River, an act which asserted their freedom. After the war, the same men and their families became active members as the Port Royal community as shop owners, craftsmen, ministers, and leaders. Port Royal slowly declined into post-war years as railroads took business formally conducted with flatbeds and the tobacco market moved to Clarksville. So this is Luke Fort fled Port Royal slavery to join the 101st United States Confederate T, I don't, I don't know what USCT, 1864 at 28 years old. After the war, he became a minister in nearby Guthrie, Kentucky. So he saved, or he lived, luckily, through this. So this is Port Royal. Let's see what it says this building is. I saw a little marker out front. This was the 1859 Masonic Lodge and General Store. Look at that photograph. That is some kind of cool right there. It says, built at the height of Port Royal's commercial success, this building was constructed in 1859. Upstairs was to be the hall for the Hamptons Lodge, number 137. The lower floor was to be a dry goods store. When it was finished, it was hoped to be the first of many larger brick buildings in the town. However, as the railroad slowly bypassed the town and the Civil War approached, history proved it to be the only building of this nature. While Port Royal was never again the commerce center it was, this building anchored the community that remained here for decades to come. Throughout its existence, this building has been the center of the town of Port Royal, and not just literally. While the upper floor was intended to serve as a hall of the Masonic Lodge, it also served as a meeting place for other organizations, such as the Port Royal's Patrons of Husbandry in 1870. 
The community also frequently used the upper floor as a school, church, dance hall, music venue, and other public meetings. Soon after dark, the unusual lights in the Masonic Hall, the gathering of the young people of the neighborhood, and a monotonous, monotonous twang, twang of Shirt Ford's violin as he patiently tuned the other faithful instrument foretold a sound of reverie by night, and on that with the dance would be watchword, the Leaf Chronicle. This is Dr. Philip Ford, 1860. This is the only known photograph of the second floor interior. So he was upstairs in this building. It says, my entire stock of merchandise below cost. We can tear down the old building and build a modern store. Salon Carden ran the final store that used this building. It closed in 1855. This is a closing out advertisement for this store. But this looks like the store never got torn down. Let's see. Can a single building tell the story of an entire town? In this case, it must. Time took its toll on the town of Port Royal, and today this building is all that's left of the once vibrant tobacco trade town. Because of this, it's extremely important that this building is preserved. Park staff continually perform historic preservation to maintain the building and preserve its historical integrity and perpetuity. So they're saying this is original. You can see that this looks different than this. So what is that about? Hmm. It still has that on the side. You can see that. So maybe it got modified at some point. Because that's an unusual design to have the, the roof come down to the edge, but the front not match the roof, I would say. This looks original. You can see the wood and all that kind of stuff. You can see where it's got the ornate wooden things here. So I think the building is original, but something definitely happened there. Let's see what we can see. You could see where the bricks on this part are different. So it used to be the other design and they added to it. Maybe just a change. Interesting. So this is Old Clarksville Springfield Road and that's Port Royal Lane. Now we've got something over there. We're gonna go over and go to the water. Stay tuned. But first we gotta go up here and look. Yeah, they're doing some restoration inside there, so you know we'll get you some photographs so you can see. They have put heat and air in here. It's a little building down there. Wonder if that could be the old post office. Hmm. Let's go take a look. But I love that this building is still here and you've got that photograph. That is a great photograph of it kind of at an angle like they were Standing here looking at it from this angle right here. Love that. Let's cruise over here and see what this is. Doesn't say. And they've modernized this. You can see they've got bathrooms here. And I don't know what this thing right here would be unless it's a pump house or something of that nature. But I don't see any information about it.
kayak. Old school. Yeah. Let's go across the street and see what we can see. My only complaint, and I appreciate them putting signs like this everywhere, but they'll, if you've noticed, they'll change, they'll do a different subject and they repeat the same things in every one of them. It says, founded in 1797, Port Royal was an early economic hub for the tobacco market of the Red River Valley, home to a tobacco inspection point and flatboat construction yard. The town served a crucial role in the early development of Montgomery and Robertson counties. Port Royal also served as a resupply town on the Great Western Road, which was the only direct route into Missouri and the west from Nashville during the early 19th century. Between 1837 and 1838, over 12,000 Cherokee people marched through and encamped at Port Royal on the northern route of the Trail of Tears. After 1859, Port Royal suffered from economic hardships caused by railroads replacing flatboats as the main transportation method for tobacco in the region. The railroad bypassed Port Royal, taking, it, taking with it the tobacco market and much of the town's population. By 1908, Port Royal was a declining community but made newspaper headlines as the only town in Tennessee attacked by night riders during a Civil War unrest known as the Black Patch Tobacco Wars. In 1940, the post office closed and Port Royal became a small crossroads community. In 1978, the state purchased and preserved the town site and the Port Royal Bridge as a state park. It says it's continued on this side. From the 1840s to the 1860s, Port Royal experienced its greatest economic period. In 1844, the Tennessee Manufacturing Silk Company and Agricultural School built a small, built a silk mill here. Government James, Governor James Jones delivered his inaugural speech in a suit made from the Port Royal silk. While the only 1859 Masonic Lodge stands today, while only the 1859 Masonic Lodge stands today, stores of all sorts, inns and hotels, manufacturing companies and educational institutes were in the old town of Port Royal. After the Civil War, Port Royal provided prospects for newly freed African Americans. In 1867, Mount Zion Baptist Church was built south of town, which was pastored by Reverend Horace Carr, who purchased his freedom before the Civil War. A carpenter, Carr ran the local ferry, other local black business owners include Tom Dorch, shoe and bootmaker, John McGowan, broom maker. In 1872, Benevolent Society No. 7, a black fraternal society, was established nearby. In 1893, they built their first lodge hall on Main Street in Port Royal. The church and the large are active organizations today. That's interesting. So, this thing says that there were many other buildings, but I thought I remembered reading over there that they were saying that that was the only building in the town. So, conflicting, yes. And it looks like you can drive down here. So they had a ferry at one point that would take you across. And then this is the Bridge. Let's see what kind of time frame this bridge is. Okay, so it's showing the bridge there. Now we're getting somewhere, and it's showing the lodge there. So this was a public area. That area here, they're saying, was the public triangle. It's showing that building up there being here which is at the corner of 25. Well, that would have been helpful. Those are some big lots, by the way. So it's showing this little river running into a big river. So the big river goes that way. This little river flows into it right there. And that's 
1797 is this. They're not showing the bridge or the lodge back then. They'll walk out on the bridge. There's a bridge down there too. I think you can drive on that one. That water sure is nice and clear with the sun shining through it. Reckon you can find some arrowheads down in there and some Indian artifacts. I bet you can. Yeah, that is a working bridge down there. So this is old school, but this is still modern construction. You can see that this thing is made out of steel and rivets. Bolts. Interesting stuff. I'd love to know the locations of some of these other buildings. Somebody down here fishing. There's the grayest ghost of all right there. All right, so let's see if we could see the church we're going to come down here and turn right. But you know, before that, I'm going to, I'm going to go across and circle so you can see down here by the water where I was at. And that, I would say, it was the post office. Because it mentioned the post office closing. Let's see if we can see a church down here. It mentioned a church being moved somewhere close. new home. So I'm turning around going back towards Port Royal. And I would have never figured a port would ever be here in a million years. And that house right there looks period. Look at that old graveyard right there. Wow. But that house, nice. That's old school. So we're going to go back down here. And I'm going to make a left. There's a little side road that comes up to Port Royal. Maybe the church is down there. I haven't seen it anywhere else.
I notice there's a law enforcement officer at this place. And the place is tiny. There's literally a guy here. I go through whole towns, there's not any cops in. And there's a guy in a truck here. Established 1978. Well, when that stuff floods, you know it gets over your head right here. So there's a guy in a pickup truck that says law enforcement on it, sitting there. And the whole time I've been here, he's been there and driving around. So I'm going to go across the bridge and see if I see the church down here. Someone still down there fishing. Maybe. There's some kind of a mound right there, is that? Well, they do kayaking here. Run amok. These are all cabins. Beautiful homes back here, kind of hidden. No church. You ever have one of those times where you kind of read something and you wish that you really did? <laughs> this is one of those times. Because it mentioned something about the church being moved. But that could have been a long time ago and it's gone now. But if they preserved it enough to move it, they cared that much about it, I would think most likely it was still around. Cattle, tobacco, and grain. Love these old farms. I was recently on the James Dean farm. It was actually not James Dean, it was actually Marcus Winslow's farm. But James lived there. Some rolling hills there. Had you taking those with your tractor.
A lot of new construction out here too. Brand new house. I saw something that looked like it could be the old church, but it was kind of the uh, path was grown over. Look at that house. Wow. It's overlooking the river. Beautiful. It's kind of interesting looking that uh that mound built out there. By that tree. Hmm. It may have been where they built the flatboats or something. Saying this takes you to the historic road bed. Maybe there's still part of a road left. Let's go take a look. Stay tuned. Trail of Tears to Historic Road Bed. So, this is where we're at Nashville, Port Royal Historic State Park, which is where we're at right now, Hopkinsville, Cape Girardeau. I filmed in Cape Girardeau not too long ago, the home of Rush Limbaugh, Springfield. Bill all the way out to Oklahoma. So this is where we're at right here today. So this is what is out beyond it. But there's nothing here to tell you what this is. This doesn't look like a road. It looks like a fire pit. Where you sit around the fire pit. Huh. I might have been supposed to make a left turn at Albuquerque and go over there. Let's go see. There was a trail off that way. It is a beautiful day, not too cold. Okay, I see what this is. It's saying Charleston, 191 miles this way. Westville, Oklahoma, 583 miles. So this is where the road was. And that's what they're showing. So the road would have basically come right through here. And I don't know what they would have done when they got to that no trespassing sign right down there. But this is where the road bed would have been through. Right through here. Interesting. Hmm. But that's what they meant by historic road bed where the, they'd actually worn a road down or cut a road through just like they do modern day. And that was this trail right here. All right, so I'm going to look one more place for the church. And that is, I'm going to go down here. And you remember that other bridge that was working that was beyond the small bridge right there, the original bridge, which would be a left turn up here. Let's go down there and take a little look-see. If I was going to move a church, I'd probably put it down here. But that's probably just me. In fact, it's telling me that's the way to go out of here.
telling you wrong, it's not telling me that. There's the bridge back over there. If I was going to put a church somewhere, I'd stick it down here. How about you? How about you? How about it? How about it, friend? This is running alongside of the old creek, this, the smaller one. The old red barn. Can you imagine if you could superimpose movement? of people a hundred years ago over movement of people today where everybody was. It'd be an interesting thing to see for sure. We can do that with photographs, but we can't do it with movement. I wish we could do it with movement. And what I mean is, I mean, we could do it, I guess, with, with video, but what I'm saying is you don't have video from that time period. It would be nice if we had video from the 1800s, early 1800s, that we could see where people were and what they did along these different places. There was a lot of traffic on this little road. Yep. See a church down here either. So maybe I just imagined it. I can find a place to stop up here and we'll show you something. What I'm going to show you is this was all corn. They picked these. That was hay right there. You can see they rolled it up. But this is corn that has been harvested, and this is what's left. And it'll actually pull the corn out of the husks. You can see the husks are here. They have machines that will, combines that will cut this stuff down, pull the corn out of the husk, actually pull the corn off of the cob. There's a piece that they missed right here. You see. But it did pull some of the corn off of it. But that is what corn looks like in the field. Right there. And see, when it's hard like this, they've got a machine that can just pop it right off. And you see, that's what it looks like when they cut corn. And Jimmy's cracked corn, and I don't care. So make sure when you're watching the Weekly Spa Guy, you subscribe, you give me a big thumbs up if you like the video, and watch the Weekly Spa Guy. Friends, thank you.